So we're moving on to our second panel uh, discussion of the day. And um, the theme for this discussion is effective public-private partnerships to fight financial crime. And we've um, specifically um, designed this panel to really have an outside in view, so to say. So a view um, and a sharing of how these partnerships are evolving globally. Uh, what are the tools, the techniques that are being used, and how to think about establishing effective partnerships for us um, in Latvia. So definitely a discussion that we will take forward locally, but really today we wanted to spend the hour focusing on um, how, how, these, um, how these difficult um, issues are being dealt with in various respects. Private-private information sharing, public-private information sharing, and the tools at our disposal. Let me introduce our panelists for this session. Um, we have uh, Rick uh, and Mary uh, from our first panel, and uh, really I see them as co-moderators uh, with me on, on these sessions. We have Anna uh, Salaviova from the ACOMS um, joining, so really great to have you on the panel. We have um, Anders Jensen uh, joining from confirmation.com, and we have Jacob Tom Thompson from Thomson and Reuters um, joining for this panel. So we will have Mary open up um, the panel with a presentation. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, again, it's a very honor to be here, and it's a privilege to be here today. And um, I'm going to just start off with, you know, a little bit lay of the land, so to speak, when it comes down to uh, public and private sector collaborations. So the objectives when it comes to this. So financial crime and money laundering and of course terrorism financing as, as we had been heard from Rick prior this morning, it's a global issue but it needs to be dealt locally. Right? It's a global problem, it's a global issue, but you need to do it uh, locally. So that actually leads into the different type of collaborations that is needed between the banking sector, the financial industry, and of course the regulators and such organizations as the Latvian Banking Associations. They play a major role in this. And the FETF you know, really stresses this in its mutual evaluations as well. But in order to really, really combat crime, and financial crime particularly, you really need to understand the risk. And we heard Alma, you talked about it earlier today in, in, the, in the former panel, really understanding the risk and how you do that. You know, you have to properly assess it. And as you said, Rick, yes, number one in the recommendation is to do the national risk assessment. And if you fail at that, you know, the audit chain will not be, will not be good enough. So it's definitely a way to start, but also to do a proper risk assessment in-house in your own financial institution. And how do you do that? Yeah, because if you can't mitigate the risk, if you don't understand it, right? You cannot mitigate the risk if you don't understand it. So by using statistics, using data, using, using analytics in order to really understand the current trends, the current modus operandi, and to actually detect the customer's behavior as well as just suspicious transactions. However, when it comes down to the obstacles, and there are some obstacles in this area, because um, we have seen that legislation is really not up to date. Um, it struggles a little bit, it lacks a little bit. It's always on the end side, right? And when it comes down to the length of the lawmakers process and actually processing, and, and then of course implementing new legislation, it takes sometimes forever. I mean, you understood that from the Nordics, and I just can tell you that the, 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 the length of the Swedish legislation and the lawmakers, it's quite frustrating sometimes. And we need to have the need for speed in this area because as the, it's an ever-evolving landscape. Adding to the problem then, of course, that we have conflicting laws and regulations. Yay, how much fun, right? <laughs> because we, we talk about the AML, we talk about uh, GDPR, and now it's a big discussion in the Nordics. So how do we comply to AML legislation, and how do we comply with GDPR? And you know, they don't have to be 
conflicting. They can be friends, right? They could join, join forces in some times. And we also have another obstacle when it comes down to new technology. <laughs> New technology, fintech, as I said, I'm from the Nordics. We do love our fintech companies. If I can't use my electronic bank ID for doing everything or do my banking services on my mobile device, you know, I won't do it. Simple as that. But new technology and, and the drive from the people in this case also, you know, makes it a little bit more difficult from the legislative part to actually be on top. Data, information, and analytics, those are just words I love. Sorry, I get a little bit nerdy when it comes to this. But in this case, when it comes down to understanding patterns, understanding behavior, it's definitely vital for an organization. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, you buy your transaction monitoring system, you implement it, and then you're good to go. Nope. You have a system, you need to know your data as well. So just, just really how it comes down to understanding and knowing your data as well. And then of course, one of the biggest obstacles is the trust issue. It needs to be established. Trust needs to be established. They need to be working out the formalities when it comes to this. And you need to have you provide the type of platform in order to actually share information. And just recently, I think it was on Friday, right? The FATF issued a new guideline on information sharing. Do you have it by, by any chance? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> very good. It's very timely, I would say. Extremely right. Just for our event. Yes, definitely. Just for this event. Absolutely. Thank you, FATF, for that. However, when it comes down to, to information sharing, that, that specific guideline, of course, is, is a little bit on the general side, which it has to be, because it's a guideline. But when it comes down to information sharing, um, it's about trust. So in order to really, uh, really to, to provide the platform for information sharing. Mm -hmm. So that is the obstacles when it comes down to this. So uh, we have been, you know, um, walking around this area, uh, this, this uh, topic a little bit during, during the first panel, but Sometimes I just question myself and I question uh, when I speak to other banks and, and to, to the fintech industry, have we lost sight of the purpose? Have we really understood what we are doing? Or how, how to move away from ticking the box compliance and to actually understand the spirit of the law? Um, we talked about ethics earlier today, and that's a major part of it as well. Because it comes down to, do you want to literally understand the law, or do you want to actually embrace the spirit of it? I think that we see in the Nordics a very different cultural change in this area. It has been, you know, okay, so we need to follow the AML uh, legislation, yes. I was giving a speech to, uh, to a bank the other day and to, to board of directors and they were like, this AML, have you heard for this, about this project now for years? Are you never done? <laughs> and of course you're, not, you're never done. So it's about embracing the spirit of the law. As I said, when it comes down to, to data, I get a little bit nerdy. So it's all about you know, collecting the clues and connecting the dots in this case. And we need to do that in every part of society. That's why collaboration between private and private, private to public, public to public, is absolutely key in success in combating financial crime. You need to understand how VAT carousels actually happens. You need to understand how social benefit fraud occurs. And you need to understand who actually is the man behind the mask in, in when you're asking about the unit, uh, ultimate beneficial owners. So it's, it's actually to this. So if we can get the public and the private sector working together, I think that we have uh, a good fair chance of actually um, being, being able to combat it. So cooperation in reality, how efficient is it? I, I just love the, the uh, different um, uh, mutual valuation reports. Uh, the, the most recent one, I think it was Ireland, um, September this year. And they had you know, a fair, fairly good evaluation, I would say. I think that they were coming out on the, on the, on the winning side, so to speak. Um, the, um, according to the assessors, the FIT assessors, they have a very good, solid collaboration between the public 
public sector and also in between the private and the public sector when it comes down to their independent uh, FIU. So maybe we should go and study the, the mutual evaluation a little bit for, for Ireland. And in August we had the uh, review from Denmark. <sighs> Not so happy. Just saying that. Um, it started off with no coordinated uh, natural risk assessment and overall inadequate understanding of AML. Yes. I heard somebody giggle over here. Yes, so yes, definitely. Not, not happy campers. And I must say that we, we in Sweden, we were a little bit surprised when we have our mutual evaluation. Uh, it came in in April this year. Um, there are some Swedish friendly FSA, uh, sorry, free FTF um, assessors out there, which we are thanking for, uh, because I think that they, it sort of like gave, not a really good picture of the lay of the land in Sweden, but fairly okay. Um, we are fairly good in networking, fairly good in collaboration, especially when it comes down to do it internationally, but not on our own home turf. We lack the public sector and the public to public sector, not so much co collaboration. And we need to get in order to actually start collaboration more to, and add the, the, uh, the private side to as well to align, to align it. And then uh, the, the Norwegian one, but that's a few years now, 2014. It already then talked about the role of the internal auditors. And I was like, yay, finally, somebody's mentioning internal audits um, in, the, in the 2014 evaluation. But the most remarks that they had there was the, the limited supervision from the uh, Norwegian FSA. It's going to be very interesting because Finland is up for evaluation. I think they will be evaluated in June next year, if I'm not correct. If somebody has any information, correct me if I'm wrong. But it's going to be quite interesting to see um, the results from the Finnish one. So into, to, to conclude, in order to combat um, the financial crime, we need to work together, and we need to work together on all types of areas and all fronts. Uh, we will always be otherwise, you know, left behind. Mm -hmm. okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, to boil it down to basics, so there are probably two tasks of AML or compliance broadly. One is to not allow any bad apples to penetrate the financial system in any given country and to get the information into the hands of the law enforcement. And so that's the issue that we uh, understand everybody is, is truly struggling with. And uh, to continue the discussion, I would ask uh, Anna to, uh, it's Rick, uh, okay. So Rick would, uh, would come uh, in and cover both the UK experience and um, then, as we've discussed, maybe sharing a bit of a sense on uh, the setups um, of FYUs, the financial intelligence units, uh, in terms of uh, what makes for, for an effective setup. Thank you, Sandra. And who's getting sick of listening to me? No, don't put your hands up. Uh, maybe, maybe later. Um, what does it mean to say public-private partnerships? Uh, when the FATF first put its standards in place uh, and when national governments uh, put the laws in place as a consequence of those standards, uh, we used to always say we expect the banks to do a couple of particular things. Know their customer and where there are suspicions that are well grounded to report to the Financial Intelligence Unit. Um, that is no longer the only expectation. It might be the expectation <clears throat> that's mandated under the law, but it's no longer the only expectation there is in the world in relation to the partnership between the public and the private sector. I'll come to private, private uh, a little later. Uh, so why am I saying this? Because I'm not saying that now uh, banks or bank compliance officers have to be policemen. That's not required, but to be part of the uh, in, uh, part of, of the intelligence gathering and intelligence improvement level of the financial crime deterrent and investigation process, there is now an evolving uh, expectation that the banks would play a bigger role. 
And around the world at the moment, there uh, are about 20 jurisdictions who uh, have put in place a much more rigorous, uh, well-defined and pragmatic approach to how that should happen. Uh, in, in particular, for instance, uh, there's a, a group of about five or six who have fairly similar uh, situ uh, infrastructures in place. The US, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore. And what have they put in place? They, they put in place, uh, to varying degrees, uh, a partnership that involves compliance officers and other officers of financial institutions and law enforcement and other uh, government officials actually sitting down and discussing not only trends, not only typologies, which they do, and not, not only strategic issues in relation to financial crime, but actual uh, involvement in particular cases. So, and that uh, diversity of, uh, of, of ways in which they're doing that is beginning to evolve into a much more um, proactive involvement of the financial institutions. So let me give you a couple of uh, examples of that. Um, I've been involved in a project that uh, <coughs> is being undertaken by a number of the large uh, global uh, banks, HSBC, Barclays, and a few others, and some of the four uh, large accounting companies in relation to information sharing and what that means and what needs to be done to solidify it. So. The essentially uh, what's being looked at is the financial institutions, what they do, their major role they play, the financial intelligence units, oops, uh, law enforcement, actually when I lean on this it turns itself off, how magic, um, law enforcement agencies and regulators. So th there are four planks to the mechanisms that are being put in place in those countries that I mentioned, uh, which all involves uh, these four major players. Oops. Um, you don't have to pay too much attention to the slides. They just give you an example of uh, the sorts of issues that are at play. So some of these mechanisms are evolving rapidly. For example, the one in Australia is probably the one that's now, I'm not touching it, it's doing that by itself. Um, but it's fine, it's fine up there. <laughs> it's fine up there, oh, it's on my screen. Uh, the one in Australia uh, is currently uh, the one that's most developed. It has involved uh, uh, what's called uh, a Fintel alliance, whereby major banks in that country uh, and the financial intelligence unit and the relevant law enforcement agencies actually de uh, designate officers to sit co-located in one place and actually go through uh, financial investigation uh, particulars, suspicious transaction reports, uh, specific investigations, and add value to the what's known about the people under suspicion. That is a, a bridge a little too far for some countries yet. For example, I was in Canada last week at another ACAMS forum, and the head of the Financial Intelligence Unit there was describing their system. They have uh, particular protection under the Constitution and Charter of Rights where certain information uh, can't go to the FIU. It has to be protected uh, for, for citizens' rights reasons. Uh, but they have found another way to make it work and still have the public-private partnership re, uh, deliver results. So as Sander was saying, what is this all about? What is the end result uh, that is being uh, aspired to? That is getting quality information into the hands of the law enforcement agencies and investigators when it's necessary and as soon as it can be made. And as I was saying this morning, uh, the value of uh, financial uh, uh, intelligence units internally, not, not just the government financial intelligence unit, but the inter financial intelligence units which exist in many, in many banks around the world, uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, not to talk too much out of school, I've looked over the shoulders of a couple of uh, heads of uh, large banks uh, holdings, let's put it that way, of their financial intelligence, and it is mind-boggling. Often they know more than the government knows about particular clients, not just the clients, but the, uh, the not just the business that they, that they are doing, but some of the uh, illegal 
transactions and businesses that they have been doing. There are a few examples of that. I'm not going to name who or where. But knowing that over the years and not having a mechanism that's capable of, of delivering on that has led to some uh, situations where the financial institutions who willingly want to assist investigators have not been able to do so. Uh, some have taken big risks and helped in a way that's close to the line of what the law allows. But in the interests of society, they've done that. That's not the way that this type of mechanism should operate. And it isn't the way that any of the ones I've just described are operating. What they're trying to do is to put in place uh, a legally protected area, uh, not just geographic, but in, 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 in a legal sense, where information possessed by the banks or the financial institutions can be made available and you can be protected, you who are com compliance officers, in the knowledge that uh, if you disclose information that it's out, that's outside a particular STR uh, and it is to the benefit of a particular investigation, then there's nothing for you to worry about. So that's the protective cushion that should be available under the law. Um, Marie was talking about trust. Certainly there needs to be, to be trust involved. And uh, that is gaining much more traction. I mean, I've seen the systems working in Hong Kong and in Singapore and in the UK and Jimlet, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force. That, that one is, they're all working well. They're delivering on what they should be delivering on. And it's not just a government responsibility in those countries. And I don't think it should be just a government responsibility in most countries. Mention was made a minute ago about the FATF putting out uh, its latest uh, November this year, in fact, right now, last week, uh, its new guidance on information sharing. It's new, but it's not new. It's old. It's really uh, a restatement of what the underpinnings of the international standards against money laundering require. That is international cooperation and domestic cooperation between the government on the one hand and the private sector on the other. What's new about it is that it puts it in a, in a way that now encourages the type of uh, mechanisms that I've just described some countries have actually put into practice. What's still missing from it, though, is, and guidance can only be guidance, but one of the primary elements that uh, needs to be uh, fully and effectively put in place is the legislative coverage for that type of arrangement. Otherwise, there will still be uh, uh, some room for um, concern unless, unless that's fully uh, put in place. So the message I'm trying to get across to you really is that financial crime and its effect on society and terrorism and its effect on people is now everyone's responsibility to the degree that they're in a position to take some responsibility for it. That's why the expectation in many countries now is a whole of crime philosophy. It's not just reporting suspicious transactions. And it's aimed at these types of things, understanding and disrupting the flow of funds, uh, various types of money laundering, uh, and uh, I think a couple of these have been uh, uh, duplicated. I'll give up on that. Uh, I'll look at the screen instead. The identification of more than 2,000 bank accounts previously unknown to law enforcement, the last one here. This is some of the results of, of some of the mechanisms that I've mentioned that have, have been put into place. What this shows is, without going through them in particular, is that the combination of the knowledge, experience, intelligence, financial information, and what's up here in the minds of, com of compliance officers being shared with uh, law enforcement and financial intelligence units is actually delivering results that have not been delivered to the degree they have been able to be in the past. And that uh, goes to the heart of another issue, I think, which is uh, the, the hoary uh, old uh, complaint that financial institutions report thousands and thousands of suspicious transaction reports. Uh, do they do that with a good system behind them? Do they do that defensively just to tick the box? But beyond those two questions, um, is it adding value? Some banks complain, perhaps legitimately, that 
it's not adding value because they don't get any feedback about whether the results have emanated from some of these STRs. Uh, or it's not adding value because it's not leading to prosecutions on a large scale. That's one part of the picture which is uh, to a degree valid but not entirely valid because the essence of the system depends on quality suspicious transaction reports and the follow-up mechanisms that are put in place as a consequence of that. It's undoubtedly true to say that uh, many STRs could be of a much higher quality than they are in any country that has this, this system in place. What I'm talking about here, the public-private partnerships, where there is actually a pragmatic partnership, not one just on paper, is, is now beginning to show that the quality of STRs can be improved once the financial institution compliance officers know what's being looked for, and the information is a two-way street. It's also being improved by the fact that the results are showing that the combination of, of information, knowledge, and experience is delivering uh, a more focused determination of where investigation resources should be applied. Uh, so there are two win-win situations here. One, the financial institutions have a role to play and they're playing it well in those instances that I've described. And two, there's a payoff for society in terms of the quality of the information that's being delivered. Because in the old days, if I can say old days, um, you might get 500,000 STRs in, in, in a given a large country. And the results would have been fairly poor in terms of consequence. I think what's now being shown is that while there'll still be a large number of STRs that are not acted upon because there's no grounds to act upon them, not everything can be acted upon. There might not be evidence that might turn out to be after preliminary investigation that they're not worth pursuing, but the bank has done its role. The added value now though is that if uh, both sides of, the, of this equation, the, the public sector and the private sector are on the same level of knowledge, they can actually define what further information can be made available to assist investigation that has been triggered by a particular STR. And that is leading to a far more well-defined uh, concentration of resources on where it should be concentrated on, where there's real, real and demonstrable suspicion. And I think that that's what the public-private partnerships uh, aimed at delivering, and the examples so far are proving that that will work. Mm -hmm. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll um, take the discussion forward a bit in, in, in stages. Uh, I'll um, actually would like to now open up the dimension of private to private information sharing and then move on to public private uh, information sharing. And in, in doing this, um, I would uh, like to ask uh, Jacob to um, share um, your perspectives from Thomson Reuters in terms of how you see um, here's a mic uh, from here. Yeah, um, how you um, how you've seen the discussions uh, with your private sector partners evolving over the over the years, and how um, how do you see vendors more generally like yourself uh, supporting these private um, private uh, to private arrangements, um, and uh, where you see um, the dynamics and the developments going. Move it up, it should be. Should be working. Oh, no, maybe, yeah. Oh, Good. No. You're on. <laughs> yep, you're on. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so, yes, I mean, certainly um, the need for KYC is well documented and uh, not going away anytime soon. Um, the challenges that KYC presents uh, is, is a burden on a bank, a bank that's trying to be profitable um, and, and, and run, run an effective business. Um, uh, and it's although genu genuinely and readily accepted as a requirement. Um, so uh, a few years ago now, Thomson Reuters um, uh, started assisting some organizations, financial services organizations with managed services. 
um, acting almost as an intermediary, collecting uh, documents and creating KYC records um, on behalf of, of banks. Um, the purpose and objective of this sort of mission um, uh, was to um, shorten onboarding times of clients, um, which was one of the major headaches that uh, businesses were experiencing, and, and also reduce cost. Um, and, um, and I suppose from Thomson Reuters' perspective, it also makes some money at the same time, so nothing wrong with that. Um, that's, that's evolved um, to an extent in various parts of the world into what's now sort of dubbed KYC utility, um, whereby these records uh, can be uh, shared amongst, amongst the banks, various different banks, um, uh, with permission, of course, with the, with the connected third party. Um, uh, we've had, um, uh, and, we've, and we've seen that um, in, in South Africa, where we've recently launched a utility across um, several of the major South African banks, uh, work in progress in Singapore, um, conversations in the Nordic regions, which are very, very interesting, though I suppose early, earlier stages, um, and, and other, other parts uh, of the world. So I think it is, it is a trend um, to uh, assist uh, uh, financial services organizations in, in a process um, and trying to make it as efficient as possible. Um, interestingly, a, a week or so ago, um, I was talking with Deloitte. Um, they are working in, uh, and what I've been speaking about really is commercial banking. Um, they are working uh, in Ireland, which is getting lots of mentions this morning, good old Ireland. Um, uh, they're working in the Irish retail market um, and utilizing some blockchain technology um, to uh, essentially create a, 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 a similar concept, um, but in the retail space. Um, I have to say, uh, I, was, I was really uh, quite excited to, to see that. Um, and, and I suppose everyone talks about blockchain, don't they? But um, to, find a, to find a genuine uh, sort of uh, uh, mission uh, that, that an organization is undertaking to utilize the technology um, uh, in a kind of a, a, yeah, a reg tech uh, way is, is, was great to hear about. I won't pretend to be an expert, but I'm sure Google would uh, tell you a little bit more if, uh, if, mm -hmm. you, if you were interested in finding out more about that. Great. So an interesting dimension. So we, we have uh, various tools in, in play here. The technology um, looking to aid um, in terms of uh, making it easier, cheaper to fulfill these functions. And then the examples that Rick was uh, sharing, in fact, going a bit of a different way. So we've, we've arrived at a certain end of the pendulum in terms of uh, automating. And we've seen that automation cannot deliver on, on all of the promises. So so would be interesting to ask Anna to share a bit more details on the UK experience and Gemlet and how have you seen kind of the, the need, um, the processes, uh, the reliance on the automation are not uh, the, the more informal exchange that matters in that case and what the results have indeed been. Thank you for having me here. Um, just to um, bring it back to the public and private yep. uh, partnership rather than private to private. So Gimlet is, is a network, is a, um, a joint money laundering intelligence task force that has been set up between the UK financial sector and the UK um, law enforcement. It's uh, been set up with a, with a purpose of combating money laundering and wider organized crime. Um, and, and it's been quite effective um, from what um, Rick has already mentioned, and we have seen some of the results in the UK. And I think it's, it's, it's good to, to, to think about why it was set up um, from, the, from the start. Uh, Rick had, and Anne-Marie had mentioned some of the issues, but in the UK, um, it's been said that 24 billion um, is what um, it costs the, the country in organized crime each year. So it's a, it's a staggering amount of money. Um, and yet, uh, as a, um, a research by the UN dated 2011, uh, suggests that only fewer than 1% of any um, unlawful funds that flow through international financial systems across across the globe um, are being frozen. So fewer than 1% are actually being frozen or, or taken away by the law enforcement. And in regards to the UK and the um, submission of um, suspicious activity reports, it's estimated that the UK FIU, the National Crime Agency, will receive 450,000 of those in 2017. 
which will be an increase on the previous year of about 420,000. Again, a huge amount of, of, of um, paperwork and, and documents to review. But research suggests that um, 80 to 90 percent of these reports across the international um, global systems, financial systems across the UK, US, and Canada, only 80 to 90 percent will actually uh, will not bring any any immediate value to to law enforcement investigations. In one country, the quoted figure was 97 percent. Essentially, almost 100% of what is being submitted by the financial sector to the law enforcement gives no value, produces no results to an active investigation. Um, I think there is one other issue perhaps is that as it may be in Latvia and in some other countries and certainly in the UK, different authorities um, look after a different um, segments of crime. So we have the tax office, we have the um, we have the National Crime Agency, we have the Fraud Office, and then we have the Financial Regulator, all of, all of which hold a certain amount of data about the, the customers and the people in that country, but don't necessarily communicate among themselves. So Gimlet, uh, in, in this case, has been um, a tool or, or a cooperation to bring all of these issues together. And, and from what we have seen has been quite successful in, uh, in achieving some of the results. Um, they, they, uh, 63 arrests have been made in, in the period between um, May 2016 and March 2017. Um, Seven million pounds uh, worth of, of illegal or suspected illegal funds had been um, retained. And, and so these this are good figures and good showing, um, going good showing of what the cooperation actually means. And I suppose a little bit more topical towards the UK and, and again going to a global problem of terrorism, um, it's been essentially very effective in providing quick and, and valuable information to the law enforcement in the investigations post um, the attacks that have taken place um, in the UK, in London and across the UK in the recent year. So um, the Gimlet uh, Corporation and people who are part of it are very proud and, and, and the, the cooperation is between 13 international and local banks that operate in the UK, uh, the National Crime Agency, the, that's the FIU of the UK, the, the Serious Fraud Office, the different segments of the police. It also uh, has the participation from the Foreign Office of the UK and the Financial Regulator. So really an, a, a quite large um, participation from all of the relevant stakeholders that hold essential data. And I think the results have been um, showing of how, going back to Marie's uh, slides, of how one can connect the dots um, and, and how you know, ever-evolving technology can be utilized and, and what the banks have spent their money on and, and what that can show in, in real results. Um, and, and, and what is essential is the proactive participation of the financial sector and from the presentations I've seen from Jimlet, it's it's really been the key in, in delivering those results. Mm -hmm. So great. Thank you. Thank you. I actually want to go back to um, to Rick as you've uh, um, exactly as, as you mentioned it's clear that uh, the FATF issuing the, the report uh, November 2017 the work must have started well uh, clearly then when you were still uh, in, in, uh, in charge. Um, how have you seen these uh, partnership discussions evolve? Who's uh, typically taking the lead role? Um, how are the different setups of, in this case was mentioned, um, the National Crime Agency, the National FYU for UK as being uh, very much in the in the center. So how does the FYU set up um, and the location within the government uh, impact its ability to steer up uh, this coordinated uh, approach? Well, big question. Let me <clears throat> try to summarize what I, uh, I think has happened. Um, it's actually been encouraging to see that it's a two-way street, that the idea for this has not come just from one side. It might even be surprising to say that uh, a large part of it actually came from the private sector because the private sector, large financial institutions in particular, who've been hammered over the years, legitimately or otherwise, uh, getting a bit tired of the fact that uh, they're always the ones who are being hammered. So could they do something that's 
indicative of their support for societal objectives in terms of anti-financial crime. So there's been an initiative demonstrated by the financial institutions themselves to add value. And the frustration that uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, a lot of filing of suspicious transaction reports and then they go potentially, not always, but from some people's perspectives, into a black hole and they never hear about them again, what's the point is the conclusion that some, some financial institutions have uh, reached. So a long way of saying that uh, I think it's an idea whose time has come. Uh, the, the law enforcement agencies uh, obviously have played a big role. The financial intelligence units, uh, government financial intelligence units are a crucial part of this because they have the mandated data collection and analysis requirement. So I think the answer to your first question is that it's been uh, a mutually agreeable uh, way of approaching things to try and improve the results, which will help both sides, both to uh, show from the financial institution side that, that they're part of the solution, not just part of the problem, or a, a reporting entity only for its own sake. So I think uh, the, the, the uh, examples, uh, the, the, the evidence so far indicates that this is working well and it's, uh, it's going to be uh, exported, so to speak speak in to many other countries. Okay, okay. And the second part of the question? You'll have to, You'll have to yeah, repeat on that the, one. On the FYUs um, and, um, and how, how you've seen them play different roles, uh, knowing that this is uh, also an area where, as you said in the first panel, the, uh, the whole movement has, been, has developed as a national response to national crime and increasingly has become international. And so modus operandi have to be aligned. Yeah. Well, that... that uh, the financial intelligence units, I, I've uh, uh, downplayed it up till now. I shouldn't do that because uh, the FATF standards, which are the reason why financial intelligence units originally uh, began to exist, uh, require that there be a central repository to uh, obtain, receive, analyze, and disseminate uh, information and intelligence, financial intelligence. If you don't have that uh, working and working well, uh, then the system collapses. I might speak here all day about uh, uh, banks working closely with law enforcement agencies. That could potentially work in one way, but th without a well-functioning financial intelligence unit, there would be no focal point for the analysis and the collection and the dissemination of material. There would be potentially some fishing expeditions for, for, for information, uh, which has been a problem years ago. I think it's less so now. So I, I think uh, the, the crucial a need for a well-functioning financial intelligence unit is uh, stronger today than it has, has ever been. But the, the real question is, um, do financial intelligence units operate in a way that uh, uh, manages the information, provides intelligence uh, product that is usable to a large degree, to a good degree, or not? And these things are always evolutions. It takes time to build up capacity. I mean, some of the, uh, perhaps I shouldn't name them now, but one or two country, large countries in the world, some of their financial intelligence units, are not viewed uh, that well by their law enforcement uh, counterparts. Uh, partly unfairly, because they think, well, you give us the information, the police might think, just give it straight to us and we'll take care of it, don't worry about it. Uh, but that, that defeats the system, because the system depends on uh, quality analysts producing good quality financial intelligence, which doesn't waste the time of investigators, but it gives them a product that has been vetted, that has been uh, filtered in the sense of uh, determining whether there is real suspicion or not. So uh, the short answer to your question is that uh, the financial intelligence units uh, around the world, and now I think there's about what, 150 in the Egmont group, um, they have gone from uh, relatively uh, low level of expectation to highly sophisticated in many instances, uh, and that's showing its results because at the end of the day, uh, there are insufficient law enforcement resources and there never will be sufficient law enforcement resources to go after every suspicion. So you have to have an intermediate mechanism that filters and uh, qualifies the information to, uh, as they would say, to, to make it actionable intelligence. 
Mm-hmm. Thanks. I think Mary wanted to add uh, something on this. Yes, com- coming back to the efficiency, I think there is, as a former money laundering reporting officer myself, um, you know, having my team sending in these these SARS and STRs um, to the black hole, so to speak, because you know we didn't know what happens with them. Uh, there's no feedback, there is no no real quest. So you know, the gut feeling or the the thing that you I, I, I stumble on something big, uh, you don't get the feedback from from the FIU to really uh, understand that yes, okay, so this was a su- suspicious behavior. So this was a modus operandi and in order to really fulfill that, that, that feedback loop, so to speak. And I think that we are seeing a, a different shift in, in that trend as well in the Nordics. And for instance, the Swedish FIU has now invited the whole industry to, to a day in November in actually to, to talk about the results from the, the SARS and the SDRs, which is, is absolutely incredible. And I think that's extremely welcomed by, by the, the industry in order to, you know, so our, our, that's the gut feeling, you know, is that okay? Are we doing the right thing? Because, you know, that's, that's the main question um, money laundering reporting officers answer, ask themselves each and every day. Is this suspicious? Is this something? Right? Don't you agree with me? Yeah. I see some nods head. So, yeah, that's, that's really the issue. Are we doing, are we doing what we can? and the feedback from the FIU. So I think that's uh, it's going to be good, interesting to see what comes out of that meeting. Mm-hmm. So it's all together or in some groups, vetted, vetted uh, members they, of the they, public? They, they start with a, with a big group, actually. So it probably it's the first uh, first session and then we'll probably be breaking down into smaller groups, hopefully further down the line. Okay, great. But it's, it's a good start. Yeah. So um, we're also happy to take the questions um, if there are any. Um, so as you as you think of possible questions, I will proceed um, to um, to under uh, to talk through a bit about the um, now increasingly available tools and techniques on the side of the financial institutions themselves to mitigate uh, the financial fraud uh, or various dimensions of fraud and, and your yours is just one of those and, and how do you see this uh, fitting in the grander scheme of things as well? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invite. I was invited here to talk a bit about how fintech financial technology can help banks and the industry in uh, preventing financial fraud. Um, I'm not a specialist in AML or, um, thank God, in um, terrorist financing, um, even though I s- used to sign off on these things when I was still a banker. Um, but I know something about financial fraud, and more particular, um, l- let me give you a few examples uh, about fraud in what we call the audit confirmation process. Um, so here's the deal, and that's what's happening all over the place. It's not a boutique uh, issue. Um, banks has got a client. Um, banks requires an audit from the client, and uh, the client has a, an auditor. Um, At some point, the auditor will need what we call audit evidence. Um, These are basically the end of year statements, can be simple, can involve trade finance and trading and all that good stuff in order to compare the books um, with hopefully the reality um, in terms of banking uh, statements. So let me tell you what happens and then afterwards I will tell you why banks should be concerned and why they should care about this. Um, So what happens today, again, not a local issue, it goes on in Germany, in France, in Tokyo. Um, We see it all over the place and hear about it. Um, Me, the client is getting way too much involved in, in, in this procedure. So auditor needs the audit evidence auditor goes to their client, please ask your bank, bank to, um, re- uh, to provide the end of year financial statements. That's all good. The banks or the client goes to the banker, the banker goes to back office, back office sends it back to, the, back to the client and the client delivers it back to the audit firm. I mean, all wrong, you have a new Parmalat case coming up, you know, anytime soon because uh, this audit evidence should never go via the client, should always go directly back to the audit firm. 
that's a waste. That's a worst case, case scenario. But we see it. I was in Vienna yesterday. I hear it from banks and audit firms all the time. Now, the more sophisticated banks, and I hear that in the Benelux, uh, I hear that in the Nordics, um, they say, well, we still, you know, the, the, our client can still require that information. So they go to their online banking um, system, um, if that exists for corporate clients, and they would require the bank to send out the, those statements directly back to the audit firm. So the bank says, this is really cool, you know, because it's efficient for me. And it goes back to the right place. I'm sending a copy to it to my client. It's wrong because I'm asking the banks, are you doing the KYC on that audit firm of that office or that auditor that you're sending it back to? They say no. Um, well, I guess it's wrong then because you don't know where it's going at, at the end of the day. You should never send that out. You should never have your client telling you where to send it. So here comes the clue where, um, and I'm really trying not to sell my company here uh, because I'm not supposed to, um, where financial technology can act as we do today with the, with the biggest banks in the world, uh, can act as a third party intermediary between those two persons, so to speak, that are exchanging information, the audit firm and the bank, and where technology can make sure that the involvement of the client, meaning giving authority, is the only involvement at uh, today technology can make sure that that information flow will only ever go between two KYC um, entities and only two people who should ac actually have a look at that not mm -hmm. the relationship manager that's I think just one example where um, fintechs um, can add value where fintechs can do something that the banks would never be able or even willing to do because it's way too costly to have a, another KYC department uh, doing KYC on counterparties that they don't even know or should know. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Thanks. I think that's a good, um, good, good example of these private to private, and also, in fact, act, acting on the question that we got in the first panel, which is how do you change the uh, compliance culture of the clients? And that's, I think, if, if we look at really zoom out and uh, the broad developments, um, the the two examples that we have on the private to, to private information sharing are pointing maybe in the direction where we'll be in the coming ten years. That if your client is not in one of these global databases somewhere, it means that they are most likely not uh, not a corporate of a standard of transparency that is required for them to be um, to be um, as a partner. And so um, I think it's it's these are some of these things where it's good for us to see these trends now to actually encourage our clients to sign up. And maybe on this one, I'll go back to, um, to Jacob. You can um, again um, cover a bit of how do you see the developments in the um, in, in the in the Nordic region and in, in within the EU and uh, some of the neighboring countries on, on this, uh, the level of corporate transparency in the information that is available. Um, sure. Um, I, certainly, I mean, broadly speaking, um, you know, over the last 10 years, we've, we've, we've really seen a, a trend, um, and actually I think Rick sort of mentioned this earlier, but from starting with technical compliance, um, putting systems and processes in place, and there are parts of the world where that's still very much the, the focus and the, you know, the, the, um, yeah, the priority. Um, that, that evolves into um, improving efficiency um, and um, taking cost out of a process that works. Um, probably layer in that, that journey um, some de-risking, um, which uh, has, has, has impacted most regions or, or, you know, uh, already. Um, and then underpinning that, there is um, certainly personal conversations I've had with MLROs. Um, there's an there's a, there's a air of frustration um, that, uh, you know what we're doing, we're being compliant, but we're not catching the bad guys. Um, that, 
I think has has evolved, and and we just heard about Jimlet earlier. Um, you know, one one example of um, uh, public uh, private partnership. Um, Probably one of the leading ones, I think, um, and uh, and I think that's that's kind of creating a groundswell, um, and there there are many more um, to come. Um, I think the looking ahead, um, the future is you know, is 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 uh, uh, cross regional um, uh, collaboration. Um, Obviously, requiring legislative change, um, a change in the law fundamentally uh, to permit that, um, but really enabling uh, uh, yeah, the collaboration to, to truly um, pinpoint and target, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, create efficient use of people's time and energy in, in, in catching, uh, you know, catching the money. Um, uh, in terms of um, what Thomson Reuters is doing um, with uh, with Jimlet, you know, to date, it's it's really been about communication and and, and uh, uh, we're sharing some SME experience and so on. Um, and recently worked on the Rusi report, which I suspect a lot of people have seen. Uh, if you haven't read it, I, I definitely recommend uh, reading it. Um, uh, at TR, we, we are fortunate that we have something called the TR Labs. Um, I'm not sure if this uh, phrase translates globally, but I would call them the eggheads of Thomson Reuters. These are the data scientists um, who play with algos in big data. Um, they're all about artificial intelligence. They, every sentence they say to you is just a, a string of buzzwords. Um, and uh, But they have a, a luxury of um, looking at technology um, uh, for technology's sake. Um, with, with Jimlet, we're actually looking at uh, how we can apply some of uh, the amazing work that they do um, to extract from big data um, suspicious activity, um, help uh, law enforcement uh, communicate and target more effectively um, uh, with, with the banks. Um, this is in its infancy, it's fair to say, um, but something that we're looking at uh, pursuing in the, in the future. So uh, exciting times, um, mm -hmm. I think. Great, great. I would want to go back to um, Brick, uh, maybe to share the um, the the extent of um, the developments you've seen in terms of sharing across the agencies. So, how openly are the SARS data available to all the law enforcement agencies? Uh, at what uh, stage? How do we um, see the the data techniques being uh, put uh, put to use uh, on on those and uh, and then, um, in terms of the, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I'll have a, I'll have a second question for you. She knows I can only handle one question at a time because <laughs> I'm just a man, right? Yeah. Uh, I think um, the what's evolving is, as I mentioned before, a much more sophisticated approach. Uh, uh, many of the long-existing financial intelligence units have. Uh, millions of reports, not just STRs, but financial intelligence reports, suspicious transaction, uh, uh, above the threshold, $10,000 transactions, you name it, uh, a whole gamut of information. And how do they make proper use of that? I mean, without going into too much detail, uh, the Egmont Group of Financial Intelligence Units, approximately 150 of them now in the world, um, has uh, an in, a mechanism whereby uh, they allow electronically a uh, search of information as between financial intelligence units. So, for example, if uh, country A uh, has an investigation going, uh, and it has uh, indicated that uh, country B may have information about a particular suspect, then they can put an initial search electronically to country B's FIU, and a flag will go up, not immediately offering the information, but uh, indicating, yes, we have information that may be relevant. Uh, then they can ask the next question, and provided it, it suits the memorandum of understanding that are in place or the laws in both countries, then uh, uh, quick and easy access to the information can be available, including information uh, that has been uh, uh, has undergone an intelligence analysis process. So the quality on both sides then uh, improves. And when I say both sides, not just country A with its investigation, but potentially 
uh, country B a triggering an investigation there because it affects the person potentially who's or other people in that other country that have been involved in suspicious transactions that could be uh, illegal. In terms of data, because of the because of the uh, billions of pieces of information available now, um, uh, I'll say this bluntly: there has to be a better way of handling information. It cannot be handled by uh, humans, uh, human analysts. There has to be a much better way of. Uh, Analyzing this is where big data comes into play and is being used by many of the larger countries and larger financial institutions that FI use now, uh, and you probably all are familiar with that. And it's it's paying dividends because it, it can automate some of the previously uh, labor-intensive an analysis that's been required by humans. Uh, but in terms of uh, of a higher level of identification. Uh, uh, I think blockchain offers, the distributed ledger offers uh, great potential um, because on the plus side, um, uh, the distribution of the information from node to node is, is shared by the parties to the transaction and that's guaranteeable and it's unchangeable. Uh, and if you don't want to continue to participate in a transaction or, or, or a smart contract as a consequence of something not being met along the chain of the transaction, then you can pull out. Uh, so that protects uh, people. What is problematic though still is that whether or not the uh, money uh, can be identified to a particular person. Is anonymity still at play? And it still is at play uh, in two ways. One, how it can get into the dist distributed ledger, and two, how it can go out of a distributed ledger. It's not clear yet whether the blockchain technology, which is excellent technology in terms of tracking a particular transaction, but is not yet aimed at determining who did it. Uh, who is at either end, that, that's, uh, that's a conundrum that's being worked on and a lot of money is being spent uh, in, in trying to, to work that one out. I think the, the other uh, r risk, uh, this is potentially a downside in my personal opinion, with using distributed ledger technology, uh, is that it, there may be uh, closed uh, ledgers. In other words, uh, you can have uh, blockchain technology used very uh, effectively, but by a closed group, including a potentially criminal group, and no one would know about that. So there, there's a plus and a minus of that technology. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see if we have any, any questions. Anyone? Um Okay, good. As you as you continue thinking, um, the um, one cannot escape looking at the list of countries we've put up that are currently regarded as the ones that are starting at least to crack the nut in terms of uh, public-private partnerships. UK, US, US Australia. Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong. Somehow, if you, if you put a lawyer's hat on, there is one, one thing that comes to mind. These are all common law countries. Mm. Anything in particular that we should take into account as we um, start to open up these discussions here? Any, any good pointers to a civil law um, country that has managed to um, effectively set up these partnerships with all the legal issues in mind? If you want to jump in, I, I don't uh, think that there is necessarily a divide. Uh, it, it, it's uh, uh, maybe the common law countries that have been involved in the examples that I, I've given uh, just a, a few minutes ago are at the forefront of this, uh, and that's partly because of the history of the way in which financial intelligence units and the financial sector have been dealing with each other in those countries for a long time. So it's morphed into a more sophisticated mechanism. But I don't think that there is any uh, systemic reason why it cannot work with uh, civil law. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's simply a difference 
uh, in legal systems. It's not a difference in, in how you make investigative uh, capacity operate effectively. So, for example, uh, I know that in France uh, they're doing this now, uh, and to the degree I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, fully aware of yet, but uh, partly as a consequence of the terrorist attacks and the need to rapidly get information across government agencies and from financial institutions. For instance, uh, several of the attacks that have occurred in, in France uh, have uh, led to information being made available by financial institutions within an hour. Uh, so the, the level of uh, communication and trust uh, and by necessity that's built up is operating there. And th uh, as a consequence, I think that this type of mechanism will also work there and could work in any willing civil law country. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone, any final comments? Okay, great. I think uh, I, in, in terms of summarizing and concluding this panel, I just wanted to say that we um, we in, in Latvia are definitely exploring and, and developing these avenues of um, public-private um, and private-private um, exchange. Uh, and uh, and I think the the ingredients that you put uh, put a, in front of us are a good basis for a discussion um, that we uh, will have as a continuation, both with the state revenue service with the FYU with the state police and of course uh, importantly also among the industry in terms of what is what is possible is the one thing that strikes um, uh, strikes as we um, as we see and, and listen on the developments is that all the global banks have concentrated their FYUs I think created their own FYUs, essentially the financial crime uh, units that are um, that are better probably than any given um, ability of any smaller or smaller country. And if we want to be part of any any international uh, banking developments, we need to find ways to compensate for for that. So that's a good um, good food for thought for us. Um, and uh, let me thank our panelists with a good round of applause. So I'll proceed to um, some closing remarks, um, and uh, we'll uh, stand up for that for a change. Um, so in terms of the um, in terms of the discussion today, um, we've um, managed to cover I think two very very important topics: the culture of uh, compliance, the tone um, from the top, and in terms of the key um, key takeaways from um, that discussion, it's clear that the um, the culture, um, the issues around the culture, whether in compliance, the risk management culture, or the internal audits role, uh, will be the glue that will help us move forward from the um, from the discussion of uh, what are the processes, procedures, and IT systems that we have in place to being a trusted partner to our um, global um, global and regional partners in in making sure that they can trust our systems uh, in, in terms of the, the risk approaches um, that we have in place. And um, the, my colleagues have been using uh, quotes here before, but I think one quote that befits here is the, um, the, uh, one of the early presidents of the US that said, if people were angels, and you know the continuation, that no government would be needed, or to paraphrase for today, if people were angels, no internal or external controls would be needed. So this was the 18th century. We're in the 21st century. It still uh, still holds. Um, so that's the environment that we, we are working on. I particularly um, liked and, and welcomed the um, injection of the crucial importance of the internal audit role. And that's something that we've been um, already having in discussions in the, in the association of, uh, of Latvian banks. And I think uh, the other piece of paper that I wanted to a bit flag around is the guidelines of the European Banking Authority on internal governance uh, that I'm sure all of you have read already by now. If not, you will soon as these come into force as of June next year. So another uh, quite monumental piece of, um, of change, uh, pretty much addressing many of the aspects that we've already started um, discussing 
discussing and addressing here. And um, it will be interesting to see how these developments shape up in, in Latvia were um, driven by the considerations of proportionality, which means how do you regulate bigger institutions and smaller institutions. There are actually provisions that allow smaller institutions on the European scale combine the cul cul com compliance and the risk management uh, functions, but in the internal audit staying separately. And again, I think this is, um, if, if you reflect on that and reflect on the discussions that our um, North American colleagues have uh, have highlighted, there is a bit of a divergence in, in, the, in uh, not in the underlying concepts, but in the way we talk about the same issues. One is more driven through the prism of risk culture and through the prism of corporate governance, and the other one is driven much more um, through the uh, through the angle of the of the assessments, the independent testing, um, and and the uh, the compliance and the BSA. So we'll have to, as uh, all of the countries that are working at the intersection of the European and the U.S. Uh, regulations, we'll have to find a way to marry these. And um, in terms of um, us taking steps to implement, um, I would highlight the the guidelines that the association has adopted over um, over the summer, in fact, in, in development, and then our council, uh, the eight CEOs of the Latvian banks uh, that are in the council of the association endorsed in um, in uh, October, um, that uh, already spell out uh, quite a lot of issues around the, the culture of compliance, the specific tools and techniques that we need to have in place, including, uh, but not least, also um, guide, guidelines on, uh, on external assessment so in many ways also through through these exercises we are a bit further if you look at three lines of defense and pretty much we have a leg regulator mandated fourth line of defense in in play already um, today in terms of the the takeaways from the second um, second panel um, I think um, again a, a good food for thought for us and and uh, quite a clear um, both timeline and also a clear sense of how we proceed from here, it's very clear that we will need to do a proper legislative analysis for how are the um, the arrangements uh, put in place uh, in Latvia for private to private and private to public information sharing. At the same time, as we proceed uh, cautiously um, in, in in detailed discussions with the relevant government agencies, for which I can say we've uh, received full support. And so, again, knowing that we're working with a concepts that are very much in development, as our colleagues here here have. Have, uh, shown that there are no right answers to any of these questions. We will have to find them ourselves in many ways. Um, so that's the spirit in which we will uh, we will take this um, forward. And the the quest for um, effectiveness uh, will be um, clearly. Um, Driven and and uh, and uh, and brought to a, a new level uh, through the Moneyval assessment that is currently ongoing. And uh, Rick, how many countries have gone through the fifth assessment? You said about about 35. About 35. So we'll be will be again among the um, not so many of uh, of definitely the European countries that have gone through the fifth round of assessment as the assessments that um, that uh, Mary was referring to were still a fourth round assessment. So a bit of a different lens there. So that's the um, that's where the effectiveness discussion will come in play, and we from the side of the association will continue to. Um, try to play a role of convener and uh, and putting out some of these sometimes uncomfortable, but the the issues that we feel uh, merit the discussion and the issues that we feel only through engaging um, and opening up um, these discussions, whether it be on on how the Latvian banking sector serves the offshore customers or um, how do we deal with the external assessments. This is what we will continue, and uh, we will um, continue with the various uh, training um, and seminar like events um, here um, and uh, look forward to seeing you in those. And as we conclude, um, let me thank um, again our uh, host, um, Bank of Latvia today, for um, having uh, uh, the event uh, on the premises. I see Mr. Nikitins here. So.
personal thanks to you as well. Um, let me thank um, our content partners um, who've uh, made the event uh, possible and rich through the discussions. Um, so uh, our colleague from Navigant, uh, thanks our colleagues from Cobalt uh, Latvia, colleagues from Thomson Reuters and Confirmation.com. And uh, absolutely um, um, tremendous thanks to ACOM's team for helping uh, both prepare, facilitate and um, ensure that we have a, a full panel of uh, distinguished speakers that can uh, cover the topics, the difficult topics that we've put, uh, put forward for us to really be able to reach the next level of, um, of discussion. So to have enough of time still for networking, uh, I will conclude here and um, we can still um, continue some of the discussions offline as well here. Tremendous thanks. Thank you.